Welcome from Mila Mr. City side. We are so happy to uh, welcome you to the next What's New in Future City Science seminar. As we all know, then cities are challenging uh, a lot of uh, problems nowadays. How to build the most uh, attractive, uh, livable and uh, qualitative cities. And today the special topic is mobility. We have uh, four very interesting uh, speakers. So, and after uh, each uh, uh, speak, uh, please don't hesitate to ask questions. And uh, later uh, in the end, we will uh, have a short discussion about our challenges in the cities and what these models, what presenters uh, will introduce today will help to solve. First, I would like to welcome Jenny, who will uh, speak uh, smart cities in the flux, data-driven planning for future city. Please, Jenny, floor is yours. Thank you, Ursel. And uh, thank you all. Um, I welcome everybody on my behalf and Taltec's behalf too. Um, I'm the professor of Future City, working in this uh, Future City um, project. And um, it's really great to see so many people here listening to this and participating in the discussion. So um, without further ado, I will start my presentation. And as was said, today I, I talk about uh, data-driven planning. Uh, it is a very crucial topic these days, and there are many definitions. Basically, it refers to planning process that heavily relies on data and data analytics. And it means that we can carry out extensive analysis in advance on the program at hand, often even uh, in a problem-oriented manner, which means we explore data to recognize problems. And of course, in current time of digitalization, this has become even more a crucial topic and it's intertwined with data availability. Data-driven planning is, of course, not new. Generally, planning has always been based on data, at least good planning has. Uh, we can say uh, that the first spatial analysis was carried out already in mid-19th century by Dr. John Snow, who mapped the starting points of cholera outburst in London. And uh, this uh, spatial uh, and data-driven approaches has been there um, to solve social and uh, planning problems ever since. But it was only in 1960s that we really realized that a more systematic approach to data is needed. And by 2000, we can say that spatial analysis using GIS had become established. Recently, in the era of internet, cell phones, internet of things, and everything digitalized, the data has exploded. We talk about big data that is combined with old traditional small data and everything combined. But bottom, bottom line for planners is that data is drastically changing how we understand urban life and means of planning cities because spatial planning is there to make cities better. Data helps in that, but only in a certain way. It's often claimed that data increases as such a democratization or the transparency of planning when everybody can get, can get access to it. But it's not all true because planning is uh, not democratic activity as such. There is no elected representation. It stresses end results instead of a universal procedure and so on. But these kind of crowdsourcing processes are essential for good planning as a complementary methods. Also, we have to remember a phenomenon called digital illiteracy. Uh, lack of ability to use digital tools divides people. There are a lot of people who cannot use digital tools or don't have access to data for several reasons. So open data is not open for everybody. 
Uh, we can say that so solution is to use data to understand better urban dynamics and new phenomena to make better planning decisions and include people in co-creation and discussion and make processes more transparent. Open data is a common goal in EU these days. There is a Data Covenant Act uh, about 10 years ago that promotes data sharing, data availability, and overcoming technical obstacles to the reuse of data. This is, of course, not uh, all clear yet. It's a work in progress to make everything open and available. Uh, Raul Calvo and colleagues uh, three years ago listed some Estonian specific issues that include, for example, lack of will with political and other actors involved in, in sharing the data, fragmentation of data ownership, difficulties in machine readability, limited access to data, lack of standards and low data quality, and so on. Some issues have been solved and some not yet. Um, another issue, generally speaking, with data is, of course, the privacy issues, which is a very uh, crucial issue and very important one. But there is also some misunderstanding of some, um, some, some uh, issues that hinder uh, the availability is that, for example, people are afraid to share their mobile phone data, which is uh, location-wise very inaccurate, but they willingly admit right to use their GPS data, which is much more accurate to any unknown third-party service provi provider in exchange for uh, smartphone apps and no idea how the data will be used after that. Another thing is that um, often data that is used, for example, in planning and uh, research is uh, aggregated, brought, for example, into grids, uh, squares. And um, for example, census data is this kind of data. There is a privacy issue, of course, but also the visual clarity issue in larger scale. But in these cases, often the access is granted only for very large unit, like one square, meter, square kilometer grid, where everything is uh, lumped together in that grid, instead of, for example, 200 meter grid. This makes it impossible to make any uh, reasonable observations of, of district characteristics and change. We can ask if data is for business also, or is it a taxpayer's property, or is it both? Uh, publicly produced data is not always available in forms that allow even researchers to use it without advanced skills, for example, programming, or without instruction of how to get access to it by the public provider. So it's very fuzzy. And this is against EU Data Governance Act. And of course, because data is, uh, can be purchased, it's, it's part of the business. Purchase data use is restricted often to a single project and a single named individual. So if we get a new, new partner in the project, the data cannot be shared and the whole process starts all over again and takes a lot of time, a lot of money. Uh, this is a notification many of us have seen you know, in the internet. Uh, it's about the internet dynamics and data storage policies all the data cannot be stored or new data can be override, overriding the old data sets. So longitudinal series uh, are impossible to, to pinpoint, for example, changes in, in certain phenomena. And this is understandable. We are uh, producing big data all the time, very, very fast. Uh, globally, 2.5 quintillions uh, per day which means uh, 1.5 and 18 zeros bytes per day. So it's very understandable that this cannot be uh, stored, uh, all of it, and it also has to be somehow organized. And there are, there are means to that. For example, all kinds of uh, dashboards, uh, platforms, uh, where we set uh, ontologies and categories for data to, to put them together for people's use. Uh, this is kind of a top-down oriented approach, and there are, um, I would say, thousands or tens of thousands of these kind of platforms all over the uh, European uh, regions. So, so very, very fuzzy area too, but very, very important and growing business. Um, but there is also an issue of existing ontologies. For example, uh, are we using existing 
um, phenomena, what is their like mobility housing, or do we try to pinpoint underlying phenomena regarding unprivileged people, digitally exclude passive or non-participating citizens, what's their role in this kind of um, data gathering. Um, then uh, bottom-up dynamics, on the other hand, uh, can be recorded or simulated. Now, I'm, I'm not sure if you can see the, because this is not the slideshow, now you can see this is a brain, but uh, it represents a bottom up dynamics of certain patterns emerging from from um, agents interaction and uh, this kind of uh, processes can be uh, simulated with the uh, micro simulation models, for example. Uh, uh, for example, here, uh, Schelling's microsimulation model of segregation in a hypothetical environment can be used to uh, simulate location preferences of two population groups. And this kind of uh, model has been applied in uh, real world uh, environments, for example, in the other picture uh, in 1990s. Um, And in this project, pro project the research is very much um, data driven and we, we study uh, this kind of uh, bottom up organized dynamics in our first uh, work package, which is related to mobility and uh, it regards a micro simulation model which be, will be uh, presented next. Our other work packages, which are all intertwined, are regarding uh, urban spatial analysis, urban economics, and urban spatial data organization. So, um, thank you. And next, um, I welcome all the questions, and uh, Mahdi will jump into this um, micro simulation um, issue of Tallinn city. Thank you very much. So maybe somebody would like to thank you, Jamie. First of all, <laughs> uh, maybe somebody would like to ask uh, immediately from Mieni some questions. Yeah. Or you can ask from uh, chat. Thank you once again, and uh, now I would like to give a floor to Mahti who will present complex adaptive system-based traffic model of Tallinn. Please, Mahdi, floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. That's I think you can, yeah, you can see my screen. Oh, okay, uh, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Mahdi. Um, I'm a PhD student in Taltec uh, under the supervision of uh, Yeni Portanen, and uh, I want to uh, talk about our uh, mobility model for complex urban environment. Uh, so back to uh, last year. Uh, first, I want to remind you uh, a short story of uh, how we started and which way we went and uh, where uh, they, uh, uh, where were us and uh, how it's going right now. So we started with this uh, left image. It was a, we wanted to use uh, complex adaptive systems and uh, mainly using cellular automata to simulate a city and the relations in the city and then uh, following uh, the emergent phenomena that happens in that city. Uh, so at first we started with a one lane, one line city. It's like we have a street, nothing else. And this street has only one line. And uh, these are cellular automata, different cellular automata that are going from left to right. And uh, it was our first uh, try to make that model. Then we added uh, some lane to this model, like this, the right, the right image, and uh, 
as you can see, we could like measure some measurements here and also add some more cars or radius them or add some lane or line to the model. But again, it's, it's only one street and uh, with different lines, which was working like this almost a year ago. Uh, what we wanted to do uh, was uh, we have a network and we wanted to add this network and this network has different lanes and lines. And then uh, we wanted to make some agents that are living in this simulation model. And also we wanted to uh, our agent to be able of finding shortest path and fastest route. Uh, I will come back here uh, again to, uh, to talk about why it was important for me at least to uh, have this ability of finding different pa path and shortest path and fastest route in the network. So after a while, uh, uh, it, it, uh, from no on, it's it's completely new to you. So uh, the scope at, at, at that moment, uh, uh, exactly in 17 of uh, June of 2021, this was our sort of view of uh, what can be the applicability of this model and the question challenge. Like uh, we wanted to uh, see if we move the traffic, what will happen. We wanted to know if we change the network, like adding some network or uh, some road to network or changing the line or reversing the, uh, for example, we have a one way segment and we want to reverse uh, the direction of the network. And also finding a threshold of different transportation uh, mode uh, to see what's their share in congestion. Uh, and we, we were thinking about that we could have a model that can have these applicabilities. Then, uh, uh, and this was our timeline, pro proposed timeline, let's say, we are here right now. Um, and we wanted to have the initial result by the end of uh, last year, almost uh, two months ago. So, uh, uh, we started with adding the network and adding some agents to the network. Uh, and this is our first result, which is for, for four months ago almost. If you can, if you uh, see, this is our office, Tonis so Maggi 14. And this is a very, very naive uh, model that is working uh, based on the network of Tallinn, a small part of the network of Tallinn. And we have almost 500 agents that are coming from uh, different parts of city to our office in seven in the morning. So because of the network is not capable of having all of them together, there are lots of congestions here and there around our office. Uh, so at, at first it was, it, it seems that, okay, we have something that is working, but uh, this is a very simple model, which is not that much data driven. It's, it is, it, the, the only data it has is the, the network itself, nothing anymore. So to build a, uh, to build a model, we needed uh, lots of data. One of them is the OD matrix or commuting data, like from uh, how many people in, in which time are going from A to B, from B to C, from C to A, and this kind of uh, relations. So for example, this is a graph uh, of the data that uh, we got from Telia, the communication company. It has uh, eight stations, different, different stations, and this is the relation between each of them, uh, which shows that from here to here, we have some, some points, some, some people that are going from here to here, from here to here, and uh, vice versa. And uh, also I uh, found some open data from, um, for, to for Estonia, not, not only Tallinn for Estonia, which has more stations. For example, here we had, we have 15 stations and Tokyo data has only four, uh, only eight stations here. Like the pink points are the data from Tokyo and the uh, uh, black circles are uh, the open data, uh, which is 
completely old for, from 2016 to 2019. And after that, we, ha we had no data. But uh, I used this data to, because I had not anything else, so I started to use them to find out a way to make my model. Um, at first, I really didn't uh, like didn't uh, ex expect that this uh, OD matrix, the, the granularity of it, this OD matrix is that much high. Like uh, I, I thought that okay, I will have lots of points here that is showing the connection, like from here to here, 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 here. But I have only, for example, in this three kilometer and three kilometer, just two points. Uh, so I started to use lots of mathematical tricks uh, to make it like a normal map, like the real map that how people are going from A to B and C. Uh, and at first, I used this like a Gaussian uh, distribution to distribute different points around each of them. Uh, when I said them, I mean each of these circles, these points. Uh, and uh, and then we have lots of different points that are starting and ending their journey from one point to another. But uh, the next problem here is uh, the time. Like we need to know, okay, from this point, uh, 100 person are going to this point, but in which time, uh, we don't know. So we need it sometimes. So hopefully tell your data has a very good time distribution of data. For example, this is from uh, Kesklin to Christine and vice versa from Christine to Kesklin. It They have uh, different time distribution. Yeah. And uh, I used uh, this to add an attribute to the model. Uh, the other thing that I did was, uh, Making some, uh, making some more realistic agents because when I am, uh, when I am like distributing these people around each of them, uh, the question is, okay, you are doing it randomly. So how to make it more realistic? I define some iteration in my model, which means that each of these agents are sort of playing in this playground, which is our simulation, are playing a human-like role that is sort of reducing their cost. The cost is uh, the time that they are going from A to B. And after some iteration, they are trying to find better way for themselves. And after some iteration, they are almost in an equilibrium, like a, like a normal city. And they learn, OK, if I want to go from Ulimiste to uh, to Toltec uh, campus, I should go from this way. And other agent learns to, uh, okay, I want to go from this another way. And uh, after all of this, uh, we made this model. Uh, for example, this is, uh, this is a, like a very small shot of what is going on under the hood in our model in almost seven in the morning. And there are people are, that are going from somewhere to somewhere else. Also in our uh, initial model that I showed you, uh, I, uh, I mean, this one. In this model, uh, I defined for each of these agents, we have a scenario that, okay, we have an agent that is going from uh, woke up in seven in the morning or other, other times in the morning uh, and going to school uh, with his or her kids. Then after school, he's going to work. After work, he's going back to school to take the kid and go home. After, after some rest, he's going to some shopping mall. After a shopping, he's going to I don't know, uh, fast food. After that, they're going to park. After park, they're going to home. And uh, it's, it's the night, the end of the night. From early morning to the late uh, evening, 
we had a scenario for each of our agents. But, uh, but after a while, I realized that it's better to, instead of defining some scenario that is not that much uh, controllable for us, for us, I define different trips. So uh, in this model, we have lots of different trips that is starting and ending. And uh, here we can, so here we can uh, play uh, more easily with or the numbers and different distribution of people in different uh, type of city. Uh, uh, and this is one of the other uh, difference between this other model. Uh, let's see how they go. Okay. After uh, running this model, it, this 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 uh, visualization is exactly the output of what I'm I'm showing you here, but it's it's only some seconds of uh, more than one hour of simulation. So uh, this is the map of Tallinn, and um, this is the I, each of these steps has a lot of the story. For example, to make this map. Uh, it it needed lots of effort to make a uh, like to make a rollable map because normally a, a normal map has lots of different kind of small segments that are not very important in simulation. So we needed to make another type of network. Um, but after all, we, we we did it, and this is our network right now, which is. Uh, they're very similar to the network of Tallinn, but it's very way cleaner than the network of Tallinn for a simulation model. And it's uh, reducing the amount of process in our application. So now, when you look at this, uh, the, the more agents that are uh, going through each of the roads, the more reddish color we have. It's not the color of traffic. It only shows that, okay, the number of people here in the red lines uh, there are more than others. And for example, here in green, in this green area and others, it shows that, okay, in that period of time, these segments of our uh, map were uh, at least one time uh, uh, was used by one of the agents. Uh, to make a colorful map, like the color or the state of traffic, it needs lots of trick. I worked in a navigation application for almost three years and making uh, a traffic layer is a very, very hard task because you need to know the free flow speed of each of the segments. And uh, after that, you can calculate the, uh, the color of uh, each, each segment. But for now, let's see <clears throat> after this simulation, what's going on uh, in uh, our map. So again, after this map and this map, I made uh, another more simpler type of map for visualization. And this color right now is showing us the ratio between uh, the number of cars that were going through each of them and uh, the, the maximum capacity of them that we define based on the open data. It is not very accurate, but let's see uh, how it's going. So uh, this is the city of Tallinn, and this is all the colors on the map based on our simulation. The simulation is uh, based on the, the time distribution of October 20, which is a normal Wednesday. So let's see uh, how is the data of a normal Wednesday, uh, typical Wednesday, let's say, in Google Maps. Uh, when, when we compare them together, uh, they are not completely the same, but they are almost uh, the same. At least they are not very, very different. Uh, so uh, right now, but what we have is a model which is working and uh, the, uh, the, the, at least uh, from the traffic layer point of view, it's almost, it seems that it's almost a good model. 
uh, but we need to work more on uh, verification and also we need to work more on uh, the the distribution of data on the map. If you if you remember this, uh, like we are uh, right now, we are distributing them very normally, like a normal distribution. So we need to optimize this distribution for each of our stations. And then we can have more accurate traffic map uh, right now. You can see the distribution right now. You can see also here that this, this is how the distribution of people is working here. And, uh, but uh, this is the, so this is the uh, current state of our model. And uh, right now we can say, if you remember the title, last year was applicabilities, but right now we can say our model has some app real applications, uh, which we can uh, move in traffic, change the network or change the lane, this kind of thing. And also we can, this model right now is capable of doing some other thing like fleet optimization verification. For example, we have different kinds of algorithm uh, for optimizing our fleet, uh, and uh, we want to, we, we can't measure them, like in real life, we can't measure them that much, but, and we cannot, uh, like if we want to make an A-B test, we need a simulation model to do that. And this model is, seems that is capable of doing this. Also, for example, for noise modeling, it is uh, right now, especially in Tallinn, it is capable of uh, noise modeling. The other thing, for example, is uh, we can do some sort of uh, social economical experiment on our model and see what's going on uh, in our simulated uh, city, which is almost very close to the real board uh, city. Uh, thank you very much. And um, I'm, I would be very happy if you have any question. Thank you, Mahdi. It was very interesting hearing and, and, and it, it's very good to see that you have developed your model further. But as uh, we are in a little bit hurry, then uh, please ask uh, questions from Mahdi in chat or we can have later discussion. But now I would like to introduce uh, Grigori Parfiono, who is traffic expert in City of Tallinn. And uh, he will introduce digital traffic model of Tallinn. So it's uh, already very practical, I believe. So, floor is yours, Grigori. Can you hear me? Yes. Super. And I assume you could see my screen as well. Yes. So, uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I'll go through the topic for the Tallinn multimodal transport model. Uh, I will tell you straight away that I'm not an expert in making slides. So some of them might be a bit dodgy, but uh, nevertheless, uh, I will cover uh, some topics which are uh, related to modeling travel demand, which is why do we need transport model in the first place? And uh, I will cover uh, quite briefly the methods. Um, I will cover our particular method we have used, which is tour-based modeling. And uh, I'll give you uh, a quick introduction on the case of Tal. So uh, I assume you've already heard this slide millions and millions and millions of times, maybe even today. Uh, sorry for not being there from the start, but nevertheless, a transport model is a mathematical uh, simplified unit of a city. Uh, maybe even at, uh, at a larger scale or, or at a smaller scale. There is different types of transport models which are uh, mesoscopic, macroscopic, or microscopic. And they are there just to uh, fulfill the needs for a particular project. In Talon, this is uh, mainly a tool to uh, have answers to the questions of traffic congestion, of optimizing uh, public transportation systems, and uh, particularly uh, understand and assess what could bring a new development uh, in the city for the entire uh, 
like scope of uh, of, of area. Uh, uh, there is, uh, as I said, there is quite a few uh, types of transport models and uh, uh, even macroscopic models that they, they have uh, a, a, a whole variety of, uh, of uh, a whole variety of different uh, types of modeling uh, attitudes. For example, there's the standard four stage model, which was four step model. Uh, in the UK or in the States, they call them differently, but nevertheless, this is the most standard uh, and typical transport model which is used around the world. Then there is um, an EVA, which, which is something like a, a well, trip distribution split, uh, which is mainly used in Germany, but not always. And then there is the tour based model, which is, um, which, which, which is relatively new, I'd say it's something they started applying something like 10, 15 years ago. If we compare it to a standard four stage model, I can tell you that that one is being applied since, uh, well, the Stone Age in transport modeling. That means from the 1950s, 60s. So, uh, and then there is the ABM, which is activity based model, but that is <clears throat> uh, something more for uh, um, uh, microscopic models. And uh, uh, I would pay your attention that it is it has nothing to do with an agent-based simulation. However, it covers some parts of it. So uh, we will mainly stay at uh, the tour-based model, as you can see. Uh, they are quite similar uh, to, to a four-stage model in terms of uh, um, what the, the area they cover. And the ABM is mainly for microscopic simulations. So a standard four-stage model, four-step model, uh, normally it uh, makes uh, standard movements, uh, standard trips. It takes into account, for example, single trips from home to work or from home to school or from school to leisure locations and from um, um, leisure locations to home back. So it's a rather simplified uh, version of understanding the movements of people in the city. When the tour-based model um, is actually all about making uh, activity chains uh, and combining them, which means that uh, it doesn't take into account uh, single trips made from home to work, for example. Rather, it takes into the account that uh, if a person goes from home to work, he might pop into a shop to grab something to eat, or he might pop into uh, a shop on his way back because he needs to buy some groceries uh, on his way back to home. Uh, this is normally made on a basis of uh, gravity coefficients and uh, attractiveness, uh, uh, attractive factors for uh, one or another location. And this is actually something which is being applied over the past 10, 15 years in uh, mainly Western European countries. However, I can tell you that uh, this technology is now being used also quite widely in the United States and even China. Um, in terms of uh, data, uh, the, the standard four step, uh, four, four stage, four step model uh, has more or less the same data set as a tour based. However, it is a bit simplified because uh, in addition to that, uh, the tour based model has also structural properties of movements, which it means uh, how are the movements structured, what's the motivation to do the movements. It takes into account time series, which means that you can specify particular uh, time series of, of the modeling area, even though normally you take the AM, PM uh, periods and the 24 uh, uh, hour models. Uh, with tour base, you can actually specify uh, quite easily uh, inter peak or even smaller time segments uh, of the modeling process. So at the end of the day, <clears throat> it has a set of advantages, which is uh, mainly it, it more or less balances the trips and the life of the city uh, to an more or less uh, how it is in life situation. So, um, but however, I can tell you that it, it has some disadvantages. I will be talking about them a bit after. Um, Oh yeah, and so basically, as I said, it's all about, uh, if you have a question, how does it work? Basically, uh, 
if, for example, there is a location where you have an X amount of people living and a, a X amount of places in the kindergarten, you take into account, for example, that uh, kids don't go to kindergarten on their own, and potentially there are people who will be willing to put their kids on their way to work to a kindergarten. So uh, considering a lot of uh, survey data required, there is, uh, I, I'll talk about the survey data a bit after, you kind of specify particular gravity factors uh, in, uh, and, and apply them to the mobility chains uh, to form out the full philosophy of, uh, of uh, movement. So uh, about the disadvantages, uh, it, it's really, bad in uh, time. If uh, a standard four-stage model would take my computer to analyze, uh, well, to cal calculate and redistribute traffic, it would take something like, well, I would say maybe two to three hours for talent, then this one uh, is taking me about seven to eight hours just to carry out one calculation. It involves about 200 to 250 iterations and um, uh, this is quite a big process as well. Uh, uh, there is uh, one thing about it is that it requires a lot of uh, separate data sets which are combined between one another. Uh, you, uh, it finds data gaps and it tries to fill them out with some uh, uh, understandable algorithms. Uh, and for any mobility chain, uh, as you can see, the, 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 uh, all of these weird alphabet units in line, uh, all of them, they are actually uh, single potential uh, trip chains, and they have a variety of factors which are, uh, can be interpreted as uh, the perspective of a person actually going from one point to another, according to the matrix, through uh, its uh, uh, well location attractiveness. Let's put it this way. Um, so, if we talk about talent in particular, then uh, we can say that it's about four hundred zones. Uh, it's one hundred thirty thousand. One hundred thirty thousand links, which is actually road segments. Uh, why is it important? A lot of people actually didn't understand that when, uh, for example, the Mayor was talking about it. It actually gives you an understanding of uh, the level of detail. Every location where you have an additional road or the, uh, or a, a road changes its properties from two lanes to three lanes, for example, that's a decision making point, which will also introduce the specific. Um, uh, delays in the movements. Uh, we have specified 11 transport systems with seven modes and uh, 12 person groups, which means that we actually covered not only talent, because it's uh, if you're modeling a microscopic model for talent, it doesn't really make sense to focus only on talent. We need to understand what else is there uh, causing transportation problems and what's the transportation demand outside talent. Although I can confess that we did not do uh, the work outside talent quite in detail, the reason for that was uh, we didn't really need to do so. What we actually cared about is the actual demand and the actual uh, trip generation attraction uh, formulas affecting specific locations in the buffer zones outside talent. So everything that has been done really in detail is everything within the borders of talent. And not so very much detail, everything which is uh, within the modeling area, which I will show you a bit further. So as I said, we have a, user, a, a whole variety of user groups. Um, we are looking at um, employed people with cars, unemployed people, um, employed people without cars, pupils, students, which have uh, different behavior aspects and, and their movements. Uh, and uh, well, they just like different things and, and they just go to different places, I put it this way. And uh, the, same, uh, the same amount of uh, user groups for outside talent as well. 
we have also specified um, what activities people do, why do they do them, and uh, specific time series, as well as um, uh, structural properties, which means uh, every movement that has its own uh, philosophy behind and it has its own stru structural property. It's quite hard to explain in a short period of time, but uh, if you have any questions further, I would be more than happy to answer them by email. Uh, at the end of the day, we have our uh, activity pairs uh, with specific uh, time series. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, uh, about 152 demonstrations for the whole homologic area. So uh, after every all data is uh, combined, you can start going through the procedures for trip generations and um, um, uh, combined trip distribution pr procedures, which are quite interesting, especially considering the fact that there is about 370 matrices for talent in the transport model. And uh, about the challenges, first of all, this type of uh, trip-based uh, transport modeling, it, uh, it, it makes it very important that you would have a good data set, uh, especially for public transportation, as we took into account a public transportation in particular, as we need this tool uh, in the face of actually uh, optimizing the public transportation system as well. So uh, that was a difficult part considering that a lot of people, they do not really uh, validate their cards. However, in this particular moment, we actually uh, <clears throat> had an additional tool, which is uh, detectors, which you can see in the new buses and trams. Uh, actually all trams are equipped and the new buses come with them. And we actually had something like 50 buses or, or something like that equipped with the detectors uh, on all uh, exits and entrances and uh, for quite a long time. So uh, we actually over-validated uh, one data set with another and uh, combined it and uh, got something out of it, uh, which was quite accurate, I could say. However, uh, obviously a transport model is something we need to update on a regular basis. And uh, um, that's how it is. The other aspect is that uh, survey behavior survey data was uh, not quite reliable and the perspective that it was last made in 2000, uh, if, I, if I'm correct, 2018, uh, 2015 as well, and some supplementary surveys have been made considering mobile phone data uh, also in 2018, which is uh, quite, uh, well, it, it, it was a good data set, don't get me wrong, but it actually needs um, uh, justification in future. Uh, and it was rather impossible to carry out uh, the behavior survey now because of the pandemic. Because the movements have changed, a lot of people stayed at home. And if we would actually conduct a survey like that, this would mean probably that we would just waste the money just without a reason, without getting any uh, accurate uh, and reliable data set. Uh, as well, we have some detectors located in, in the city. Uh, unfortunately, the service system was not uh, available everywhere. And there were specific places where we actually had to <clears throat> go through uh, camera accounts and counter validate them against the historical area um, uh, complications. So uh, as I was mentioning previously, this is more or less the uh, modeling area for Tallinn. It takes into account uh, everything with what is around the ring road. Uh, I would say it's quite in detail, uh, but what is really in detail, and you can see that according to, to the transport zones, the transport zones for Tallinn, they're a lot smaller than the ones which are outside Tallinn. But what actually matters for us is that we could understand what's the impact to the Italian uh, transportation network from all sides of things. So uh, this is just an example of what we can do with it. We can actually uh, understand where do the transport flows come from on a particular uh, road segment. For example, this is uh, just in front of Christina on Endless Street, and uh, if you close it, you can see where uh, the traffic flows will then go to, 
in this case. So potentially uh, it gives us a variety of uh, tools to understand what would happen if, for example, we decrease uh, road speeds or what will happen if we will introduce an additional bus lane or what will happen uh, if we introduce uh, an additional car lane. However, I can tell you what is important. Uh, you can, uh, it's how you interpret the results uh, because if you have a traffic jam somewhere, obviously you can put an additional lane and you think that everything will gonna work, but this is not problem solving. You should actually reanalyze the whole system and find the issue of the problem and try your best not to add an additional uh, car lane. As well, this is uh, just an example of uh, public transport uh, tram line number four. Uh, you can see the whole profile of people entering, exiting. There is a lot more to that. It's just I took just three of them uh, on a particular stop. And um, what is very important for us as well, uh, here you can see how will traffic flows change as soon as the uh, one of Sodoma tram line will appear. And if I'm correct, uh, this is actually <clears throat> the morning or evening uh, peak hours. So basically, uh, you can see that there is somewhere uh, traffic uh, passenger counts they decrease. I was thinking, how are they decreasing on already? And then I understood that uh, basically there is some bus units, uh, bus lines going through Las Namai, and some people are actually tend to uh, interchange the tram line somewhere elsewhere, not in the city center. So uh, it allows us to assess how, uh, how good would one or another public transport project would actually work for us. Uh, there was a lot of comments, especially in the media in the previous days. Uh, I'm pretty sure you're aware of that, that we do not take into account uh, walking or cycling or whatsoever. Um, well, actually, I would like to say that we actually do consider walking and cycling. And here you can see an example of a walking matrix, uh, which means that every time we carry out the procedures, uh, the calculations and trip distribution pro procedures in the model, uh, the attractiveness of one movement or another, it changes. So uh, the same goes with cycling, actually. And basically, uh, even though it doesn't assign uh, the pedestrians to a particular uh, road unit, because a macroscopic model should not do that, actually, this is something you can apply to a, pedestrian, uh, to a micro simulation model. Um, uh, I can tell you for sure that it still gives you an understanding from which zone to which zone there is the demand for pedestrians. So even though we don't have them assigned to a particular link, so basically if you just point out any link there, you'll have uh, passenger flows on, 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 public, uh, on, on public transport and their uh, car units on, on a particular link, speeds and, and all other variables. Um, it will not give you an understanding how many passengers go through. However, it's still possible to do It's just, it, it, you normally, like international practice says, you do not normally do that on a microscopic scale uh, model. It's something you normally do on smaller scale uh, microscopic models. And what's very important actually is, uh, this was my personal pain in the neck for quite a long time. Uh, after you put everything together, you, you, you run through the model and that gives you some answers. And uh, uh, you have uh, the observed uh, numbers for uh, either passenger transport, public transport, or, uh, or for uh, uh, vehicle, uh, personal transport. And then you have the models and, and you need to combine them and understand what's actually happening. And uh, normally it's very good if uh, the mean average error is uh, something like uh, 15%. So it's 85% accuracy in our case. At, uh, we managed to get uh, the error around 12%. And um, I, I'd say that's quite good. Uh, and uh, I don't have it here for public transportation. Public transportation is something like uh, 20%, but uh, there is room to actually improve it significantly. And uh, this is the the thing I'm working on at the moment is to actually make uh, public transportation more accurate. 
but it requires additional data sets, for example, uh, survey mobility data. And, and this is something, uh, well, as I said previously, a model is something, it's like a living organism. In order to live, you need to update it on a constant basis. And this is what we will be doing on uh, considering all of our projects we have. So uh, considering we don't have a lot of time left, it, I'm very sorry for a very brief introduction of the uh, transport model. But if you have any questions, I will be more than happy to answer them. If I won't have time to do it now, uh, please send me an email. Okay. Thank you, Grigori. It was very interesting and I'm very happy to see that uh, Tallinn has its uh, traffic model so that it will be valuable, I believe, for e everybody in, in Tallinn. So, but we have one question here. Yeah, I hope that uh, some, some more questions as well, because uh, thank you very much for this uh, very promising presentations about uh, different uh, simulation models. But um, I have a question to, to Grigori. Uh, you know that uh, we are planning uh, uh, mobility research in Ulemisti area right now. And uh, uh, we have talked about possibility to use this uh, uh, simulation uh, uh, model, uh, this uh, transportation uh, uh, simulation model in um, in our um, uh, research as well, and maybe you shortly uh, um, could uh, explain, or I'm wondering, what kind of uh, concrete new possibilities or practical possibilities uh, this uh, model uh, may may give us if we uh, want to know our uh, mobility situation and maybe uh, some uh, new uh, possibilities to uh, develop here uh, in the Ulemisti area, our traffic situation and how to go on, some prognosis. Yeah. Uh, the question is very understandable, especially considering that you are uh, willing to develop Ulemisti city um, in a more wide scale than you are doing up to date. And uh, well, I mean, considering the skyscrapers and, and all of those for development, I, I can tell you that this, uh, the transport model we are having uh, is quite suitable to assess uh, quite a few aspects of the development. However, this is something we should discuss separately uh, and consider the workload we are having right now already. Which, uh, which means that uh, we just have to schedule the procedure. This is one aspect. The other aspect, uh, at the end of the day, it's all uh, very important on the behavior aspect. I mean, how are you willing to make your people behave inside your, uh, I will put it this way. As I, as I mentioned here, every time you're doing something uh, the uh, attractiveness of your mobility rate of, of, of like sustainable use of transport will gonna change with every iteration. If, you, if you're adding additional car park spaces, for example, uh, this means that you're promoting the attractiveness of personal vehicles and decreasing the attractiveness of people walking, cycling um, or, or using public transport. So this is actually an issue how we can assess whether we are doing something good in, in, the, um, in the overall strategy or are we going somewhere wrong direction? I don't know whether I've answered your question or not. Okay, thank you. It's, uh, I hope that uh, your, your or our city, this prognosis uh, model uh, something um, explain for us some some new aspects I'm, I, I, I really hope I think, think you, you've already made uh, uh, you've already made some kind of a survey some time ago which kind of yes of course yes of course after two years <laughs> two uh, every every two years but I believe I gave you some feedback this week regarding the uh, technical 
aspects of, of, of the survey. And uh, considering I'm going away on holiday today, I, I'm more than happy to talk about it with you after I come back in a week time. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I, I don't see the questions in chat, but maybe I can ask one question uh, from my side. So, uh, do you have exact plans based on this uh, traffic model? Most probably you've got some kind of new ideas how to develop public transport further and, uh, and as well maybe road. Do you have uh, already some concrete ideas? What would you like to do in Tallinn to improve customer experience in traffic? Yeah. yeah. And if uh, I, I may, uh, maybe some uh, <coughs> more exact uh, ideas about Tartumante. <laughs> uh, I can tell you that we have uh, a set of ideas already con considering the transport model. Uh, however, I will probably not discuss them with you at this very early stage because uh, we have a deadline of half a year to introduce all elements to uh, our main managers, to the mayor, and uh, so on. So mm -hmm. I think it's not the right time to discuss. Okay. Um, okay. Then maybe our next seminars. <laughs> so it, it was very good to talk to you. Unfortunately, I need to leave you for another meeting. And if you still have some questions, please feel free to send me an email. Yeah. Thank you, Grigori. It was very interesting, and I hope we will see you soon. Thank you. And uh, now I'm happy to uh, introduce uh, Mark Brauer, who will be even more practical, I believe. Uh, so he will talk about smart transportation uh, and uh, with real project, uh, how to collect data and what, uh, what plan city have. Please, Mark, floor is yours. We can't hear you. You're muted. Mark, maybe you can unmute you, your microphone. Yeah, sorry about that. Super. Now it's better. <laughs> yeah, just give me a second here. Okay, uh, my name is Mart. Uh, I work at the Italian Strategic uh, Management Office as a EU project manager, and I will give a short uh, overview today about the Smart City project, which is uh, currently in our portfolio, and it's called AI for Cities. As a forewarning, my presentation will be much lighter on academics and math and numbers, uh, contrary to previous uh, presentations. So what is this uh, project about? Basically what we are doing is we are looking for AI solutions to accelerate uh, uh, Tallinn's transition towards carbon neutrality. And to do that, we use a pre-commercial procurement approach. And this is a bit different uh, than uh, your usual uh, procurement uh, projects. Essentially what we are doing is we are not uh, buying products off the shelf. What we are doing is we are buying the process of innovation. We are buying R&D, uh, we are buying product development and we are buying uh, something which is not yet on the market on one hand. And on the other hand, we are buying something which goes beyond current the state of the art. So essentially we are buying uh, innovation. Uh, the project uh, consortium consists of uh, six cities. Uh, basically you can consider these six cities as uh, buyers. In addition to Tallinn, we've got Helsinki, Stavanger from Norway, Copenhagen, Amsterdam and Paris. The project is uh, three months uh, in length. Uh, it started uh, early 2020, so we are currently uh, in our third year, and the total budget is 6.6 uh, .6, uh, million. Um, so just I, I thought that I'm going to uh, maybe say a couple of words about this um, 
a project process as well as this uh, pre-commercial procurement is not so so well known. Uh, the process starts with an open market consultation. What essentially this is, is we uh, engage in a communication uh, with uh, players in the industry, uh, startups, uh, small businesses, and uh, small and medium sized uh, enterprises. We say that, okay, we are currently uh, doing uh, this project, and maybe you would be interested in, in uh, supplying solutions in conjunction with this project. Then we published um, the official request for tender. It was done early uh, 2021. And we got, if I recall correctly, I think we got 54 tenders all over Europe, also a couple from Estonia. And out of this uh, 54 uh, companies, 20 entered the first phase which we call solution design. And uh, each company who entered this first phase got roughly uh, 40,000 uh, euros from us. So essentially during this first phase, what the company the companies did is that they developed a so-called proof of concept about the solution and also uh, did a, a feasibility study. Uh, the second phase uh, is called prototyping phase. Uh, Ten companies enter this phase uh, from uh, phase one. So out of 20, 10 in, in this phase. And as the name says, uh, companies uh, developed a prototype at the end of this phase. And the uh, pr prototype is, uh, have to, has to be, of course, usable and uh, they had to give access to each of the biocity representatives. And each company in this phase got uh, 80,000 uh, uh, euros from us. And the final phase, and this is the phase we're currently entering into, is a product, uh, product testing phase, or in other words, a piloting phase, and uh, free companies from mobility uh, and free companies from energy. Yeah, this is uh, something I forgot to mention. We had like uh, two lots in this project. Uh, one lot for us, lot for, us for, was for mobility and the other lot was uh, for energy. Italian participated or participates only in, in mobility lot. And three companies from each lot in this final phase and the final money for each company was uh, a little bit uh, in excess of 200,000 uh, euros. And some examples about uh, the companies we worked with uh, during phase one, as I said, out of 54, 21 uh, got into this phase. And uh, you see here some domains, uh, as expected, most of the companies were providing solutions in uh, Mars and shared mobility, we also had four from traffic flow optimization, a couple from pollution monitoring, uh, public charging, cycling, uh, parking optimization, uh, smart uh, intersections, uh, logistics, and uh, digital twin development as well. Uh, 15 countries were represented all uh, were from, from Europe. Uh, into phase two, we selected 10 companies, three uh, from Mars uh, domain, uh, two from traffic flow optimization, one from pollution monitoring. There is some overlap between the domains here, as you can see. A public charging uh, company from Germany, uh, smart intersections, uh, uh, logistics, and uh, one company from uh, digital twin domain. And unfortunately, no Estonian companies here. Um, and I thought a bit, uh, what should I focus on uh, during my presentations? And I thought that maybe it would be interesting to uh, see uh, how we evaluate companies entering now uh, into final phase three. And we de developed an um, evaluation model. Uh, currently, you see the uh, criteria here. Uh, we assigned uh, a weight 
to each criteria. And as you can see, the most, uh, two most important uh, criteria for us as uh, buyers are uh, CO2 emission reduction, and of course, the uh, use of AI. I will uh, come back to this uh, later. And another important criteria is, of course, innovativeness. Also, we want to see uh, some scalability, usability. We also want uh, companies to present a solid uh, project and piloting plan. Uh, we also want companies to ensure that the solutions are safe and secure, um, mainly when we talk about cybersecurity here. Uh, I think it goes without saying that they have, have to be relevant to the cities, to the six cities I mentioned uh, previously. And of course, they have to be commercially viable. And final uh, criteria is price. And to go into more in depth about these, uh, these criteria, when you talk about the emission reduction, uh, I think the most important thing to note here is that um, the companies uh, have to prove that their solutions actually reduce emissions on one hand, but on the other hand, they have to uh, be quantifiable meaning that they have to actually present a methodology of CO2 reductions. And this has been extremely difficult to do. We enlisted the help of a Finnish company uh, who uh, presented us a, a solution for this methodology. And, and each of these 10 companies now applying for the final phase have to use this methodology. And prove that their uh, their solutions actually do uh, reduce uh, emissions and how much exactly. And when we talk about AI, I think uh, the most uh, the three most important um, uh, criteria to touch upon are are is the AI autonomous, meaning um, it can work at least partly. Um, a part of human intervention. And the other thing is that whether this AI solution is adaptable, meaning it can improve from, upon its algorithms uh, based on learning uh, from past experience. And third, uh, and the last important uh, thing here is data. Uh, how uh, accessible is the data uh, for this AI solution and how the cities can provide necessary data for this AI solution to work. And to be honest, this has been a huge pain, especially when we talk about Tallinn, because uh, Tallinn as a city, um, how should I say it politely, of course we have data, but it's very hard to actually provide this data for the companies to work with. And um, yeah, it's, it's been a huge pain in the ass, pardon my French. Uh, another th important things are criteria innovativeness, of course, you know, scalability, usability. Uh, I wouldn't uh, dwell mm -hmm. much on these uh, criteria, so running out of time, I guess. And also safety security, especially in regards to cybersecurity, uh, relevance to the cities, uh, we, the companies have to be sure that they have uh, the means to actually pilot the solutions that they developed in, in, in the six cities participating in this project. And of course, the product has to be commercially feasible and viable because at the end of the product uh, pro project, the companies have to license their product to the cities uh, to use. So the, the uh, IP rights are, are within the cities. And uh, the companies also have to visual, visualize this uh, whole project on a, on a lean, lean canvas, business model canvas. So that's it from my side. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Mark, but uh, what 
could be the practical outcomes. Uh, so you talked about this project and, uh, and everything, but uh, I have heard that you have as well practical uh, outcome or project based on this. Uh, so maybe you can mention it uh, a little. Not sure. I don't know. Because uh, as I said, currently we have six companies in the pipeline out okay. of this, uh, sorry, 10 companies in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. Out of these companies, three will be selected for the final phase. At this moment, I have no clue what these three companies will be, uh, what their solutions will be, but they will be piloted in Tallinn as well. So that's the thing I can say, mm -hmm. what's gonna happen. Uh, what happens after the pilots? Again, I, I cannot say, hopefully, we can utilize them for a foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But uh, you, you mentioned as well the uh, pain to get the quality data. So will this project uh, data, what this project uh, will generate, will be added to telling traffic model or this data will be uh, available for university, for research, or uh, how, how will you behave with this data, what this project will bring to your table? Mm. Uh, probably not the right person to answer the question, but uh, um, to be honest, we did not uh, generate additional data points in conjunction with this project. Mm -hmm. We maybe made some things more readily available, but that's 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 the extent of it. Okay. Thank you. Does somebody have a question? If not, then um, uh, today we heard about uh, the challenges of getting data and, uh, and uh, how uh, we will get in it in a faster and uh, more dynamic way. Uh, we have had challenges of uh, training our models and, uh, and uh, working with uh, it. So, I believe this challenge will not uh, leave us and uh, it will be our future. So uh, we need to be clever how to collect data, store data and make it uh, usable for third parties. Uh, thank you for everybody who had time to, uh, or have time to uh, participate our event today. If you have any questions, uh, then please do not hesitate to send these questions to us. And then next time, uh, in next uh, seminar, we will talk about uh, how we will develop urban vitality model. So how urban will, how uh, cities will be more vital, more livable and uh, so on. But Jenny, maybe you would like to have a, the third word for a finish or ending. Yes, yes. Uh, I would like to thank you also for, for being here, uh, listening to these presentations and participating in, in discussion. Um, as Ursa said, this is a very crucial issue about data, its availability and the processes, how to make it more open. And to be honest, I think from the positive side, we are in the very beginning of this process of working with big data. So, so I'm I'm very um, looking forward to the future, <laughs> positive with a positive mind that we are able to learn and and our systems will develop, and we're part of that development. Now. Um, this is this was actually as Ursa also said this is also um actually a series of presentations uh, regarding future city uh in the framework of uh, data models and and uh and digitalization so um our next uh next um seminar will be about uh urban vitality and uh related to that uh, spatial um, dynamics and spatial analytics and how to uh, pinpoint vital areas and develop them in the era of digitalization. A very crucial topic again. Uh, mm -hmm. Then one 
small piece of news is that we are planning to start a blog uh, about around this uh, future city project and all these issues. And um, I don't have the date yet, but I would assume that it starts at some point in March, um, maybe with uh, some, some uh, writings circling around the topics of this seminar. So we will send you all information of that. So please be welcome to delve into these issues also through the blog. But um, thank you very much on my behalf too. Thank you for everybody and uh, let's see you in next seminar. <laughs>